department documents that are continuing to be released. Welcoming to the stage, Julian Assange's father, John Sutton. The second person I'll welcome to the stage is probably someone who doesn't need any introduction to a West End, the West End audience, I'm sure, is Kieran O'Reilly. <laughs> so, the event will there'll be two journalists conduct these interviews. They are both from the Independent Australia website. The first one is uh, David Donovan, who was born in 1970 and has vast experience in journalism. Um, Kieran, you've become famous for, among other things, your non-violent anti-war protests, um, for which, uh, for defacing and disabling war aircraft, American war aircraft, you, like Julian, served some time in prison. Uh, I think 12 months in the prison in prison in the US. Is that right? Thirteen. Yeah. Thirteen. Yeah. <laughs> just, um, just wondering whether you could explain what the conditions were like for you and what, uh, what it was like. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country and also acknowledge um, uh, the war of genocide against them and a war that continues, which is convenient and an explanation of 30% of the prison population in this country being Indigenous. And also acknowledge the war against the people of Iraq. And that's the context in which Chelsea Manning finds herself back in prison and Julian in a British prison. And I, I actually coincidentally happened to be there the first day of that war. We were at the Pentagon, Hiroshima Day, and um, Margaret Thatcher and George Bush Sr. turned up and announced the sanctions on Iraq. And uh, then we had the drive-by Gulf War One, where they dropped eight Hiroshimas on Iraq. And then we had the collapse of the anti-war movement. And then we had 10 years of sanctions where a million children were killed. And then we had the invasion. And then we had the occupation. And now there are thousands of US troops being sent back there as we speak. Uh, prisons are designed to, for every prisoner uh, to demoralise and defeat you, and especially for political prisoners to get you to recant. And in my situation, I was sentenced to New York and put on Con Air and flown across the country through Oklahoma to El Paso, Texas, and then shipped out into the outback and put in a, a very overcrowded jail. I was the only gringo in the jail. Only representative of the master race, and uh, only white boy, and uh, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> and so there were 24 of us in a cage. Um, the cage was about this wide, and then six cages welded together in one room. There were three prison officers who disappear at the first sign of trouble, and it would take about 40 minutes for the right squad to come back in. So it was a very violent uh, and boring uh, place. And the only thing, the first month I had a lot of harassment, low level assault, uh, harassment by the prison officers and, the, and other young gang members. And that disappeared once I started getting correspondence in. And uh, the, the staff backed off immediately, not feeling I had reach on the outside. And I got popular with uh, Mexican, Mexican stamp collectors and kind of built my popular base from there. So I really encourage you to write to Julian. Um, it sends a message to the staff that he isn't forgotten, and it also... I've been with Julian in the embassy when he opens uh, letters, and it's... it's uh, I mean, the biggest thing for a prisoner is knowing your out date, and Julian for nine years, and it was nine years on the 7th of December that he's first taken the one. Secondly, and I was talking to a Guardian feature writer, and they said, he said, no, it's uh, more serious than that. Journalists value being the gatekeepers of secrets. Who gets to know, how much they get to know, when they get to know, and WikiLeaks comes along with the primary data and goes, you work it out, you know. And then, I th but more seriously, I think uh, it's possible the US grand jury after m are more than just Julian, and some of those might be Guardian journalists. So the attitude of, we'll give you the head of Julian Assange if you leave our boys and girls alone, I think is a possibility. And that was one of the reasons the judge, judge argued that the indictment shouldn't be open. It was a secret indictment until they played it, and he argued that they still might be pursuing other people. Yeah. And it, it's interesting that Somerset Bean uh, from Adelaide uh, the, the DOJ had just asked Google for all his stuff, and he, he's basically the graphics guy who puts out posters and stuff, so I don't know how broad the net's going to be. Uh, Kieran, you know, while, you, while you're speaking, what similarities do you see between your situation, your case, and Julian, Julian's event? Yeah, I think, um, you know... The uh, uh, Julian is in a, a dire circumstance. Um, He's lost 15 uh, kilos of weight, very skinny now. 
is uh, in solitary confinement sort of for 22 hours a day. Um, he, whenever, he, whenever I go to visit or when anybody goes to visit, the hallways are cleared and Julian's brought down in, through empty, long empty hallways into the meeting room. Um, there's about usually about a hundred other prisoners and their visitors in the meeting room. You, there's cameras everywhere in the ceiling and uh, each prisoner wears a uh, band. Um, you have to speak like this so that you can't be lift, lip read if you have, want to exchange private information. You know, if I ask Julian, how are you? Um, or any other personal information, you know, his children or so on. Uh, so after nearly 10 years of ceaseless psychological pressure in an increasing intensity and trajectory in the last two years where every single move and voice and action he made in the embassy, every single one, nothing. So the toilet, everything, the ladies toilet had microphones in it because uh, the lawyers and Julian would occasionally have their uh, conferences there so that they wouldn't be overheard. But they installed a, a microphone behind the uh, paper towels. So you can imagine the effect of that year after year. And towards the very end, rude and aggressive security men. Uh, lawyers uh, given permission to visit and sent away. Um, food forgotten to be delivered. It's their responsibility to feed him. He can't go out. Uh, he had an abscess on his tooth. Uh, and his lawyers wrote to the UK government that could he cross their land to go to the dentist. They said, you come outside, you'll be arrested. So you can just get you know, a picture of the ceaseless persecution in particular, in particular delicate ways that Julian underwent, detailed ways. After five years, the room he was in, he knew every crack, every thread falling off the curtains, every piece of paint peeling off, uh, a bird landing on the window is a friend, you know. So, not good circumstance. I, I think here in the Shadow Foreign Minister of People of Integrity, who, when Julian was dragged from the embassy, said he shouldn't be extradited to the United States. I mean, will was, say he got deported to Australia, then we'd have to go on the front foot very quickly to defend him here. Ian Kerr, Community Radio, Portable Z. Yeah. The man behind you uh, says, bring Julian home. Now, I'm, I'm wondering if there's anyone here who seriously thinks that Australia, given its track record, is a good place uh, for someone like Julian to be afforded uh, democratic rights and human rights. Um, Australia, on, on both sides of, of politics, have um, never lifted a finger to help him. And I'm wondering whether people think that he might indeed be safer in Great Britain, given that there's an election coming up, um, and there's you know, maybe a remote possibility that Jeremy Corbyn would get in, and that I think he probably would do the right thing by Julian. Thank you. We can only do one thing at a time. First thing is bring him home so he can spend a bit of time with his family and kids, have a cup of coffee out on the sidewalk, watch the passing parade and breathe the air in. The next thing, if they try and extradite him, well, we'll fight that too. And we'll win. Hello? Uh, my name is Sean O'Reilly. I just want to ask uh, anybody who could give me an answer in regard to the um, Australian sort of journalism fraternity, because I've written to a number of high-profile journalists, the chief editor of the uh, Guardian in Australia, the president of the Australian of the National Press Club, um, and had no response from them at all. And they, in fact, they put up comments to articles they've published 
and have had those comments taken down. Um, I wonder if after the uh, presentation to the National Press Club last week from the Editor-in-Chief of WikiLeaks has has the Australian Fraternity of Journalists changed their response or lack of response um, and could someone explain to me why it is to have had such silence from Australian journalists with a few exceptions. Well, I think as I answered, struck my older brother on the way to the world. Um, I think the mistake we make often in social movements is thinking that the media is some kind of objective social service when they're actually corporations that are profit driven and run by very powerful people. I mean, what's been a, such a shame is the uh, campaign about press freedom uh, in Australia that, that, and not including Julian Assange's persecution as an Australian journalist. I'm also disappointed with Peter Gresti um, saying that Julian isn't a journalist. I mean, journalism is it's not ordination, you know, it's, it's something you do. We're all journalists. It's a basic right uh, to, to be able to write and reflect on things that are happening around you. And uh, yeah, that'll lead us perhaps and lead nowhere.